for the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I am once again Bill Mallory, and once again here at the La Jolla Library. Um, hey, big day today. We are starting a brand new book. We are starting Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini. And uh, I understand that, uh, I guess not a lot of people may know who Raphael Sabatini is. So um, I, I had read this book many years ago. Um, and really enjoyed it, and um, but it just sort of came to me on, on a whim. I just sort of saw it in passing and thought, "Oh, that sounds interesting," and uh, and picked it up. And um, and so I want to give you just a little um, synopsis of who this person is, considering he doesn't seem to have quite the notoriety in a, in America uh, as as some other writers of his age. Um, it says here, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna. I'll be over here reading off the computer, so don't mind me. Raphael Sabatini was born in Aiesi, Italy, to an English mother and an Italian father. His parents were opera singers, who then became teachers. At a young age, Sabatini was exposed to many languages, living with his grandfather in England, attending school in Portugal, and as a teenager in Switzerland. By the time he was 17, when he returned to England to live permanently, he had become proficient in five languages. He quickly added a sixth language, English, to his linguistic collection. He consciously chose to write in his adopted language because he said, quote, All the best stories are written in English. After a brief stint in the business world, Sabatini went to work as a writer. He wrote short stories in the 1890s, and his first novel came out in, in 1902. In 1905, he married Ruth Goad Dixon, a daughter of a Liverpool merchant. It took Sabatini roughly a quarter of a century, uh, a, quor a quarter of a century of hard work before he attained success with Scaramouche in 1921. The novel. A historical romance set in the French Revolution became an international bestseller. It was followed by the equally successful Captain Blood, 1922. All his earlier books were rushed into reprints, the most popular of which was The Seahawk from 1915. Sabatini was a prolific writer. He produced a new book approximately every year and maintained a good deal of popularity with the reading public through the decades that followed. So there you go. Um, if you take a look at uh, some good old movies, you'll see Errol Flynn is in a lot of the adapted works of Raphael Sabatini. He was in Captain Blood, and I believe he was in um, Seahawk also, but not in Scaramouche. And... Maybe at some point in the future we'll read Scaramouche, too. Um, so um, I'm going to I'm going to start reading here. I'm just, just going to do the first two chapters today uh, to kind of uh, introduce things. It's uh, I pulled this. I don't have my book yet. I, my, my book is coming. But um, I pulled uh, this off of wiki, off a, I'm sorry, uh, off of Project Gutenberg. And yes, I did print the pages because I hate trees. All right, if you are ready, we'll start at the beginning. Chapter 1, entitled The Messenger. Peter Blood, Bachelor of Medicine and several other things besides, smoked a pipe and tended the geraniums boxed on the sill of his window above Water Lane in the town of Bridgewater. Sternly disapproving eyes considered him from a window opposite, but went disregarded. Mr. Blood's attention was divided between his task and the stream of humanity in the narrow street below, a stream which poured for the second time that day towards Castle Field, where, earlier in the afternoon, Ferguson, the Duke's chaplain, had preached a sermon containing more treason than divinity. These straggling, excited groups were mainly composed of men with green uh, boughs in their hats 
and the most ludicrous of weapons in their hands. Some, it is true, shouldered fowling pieces, and here and there a sword was brandished, but more of them were armed with clubs. The most of them trailed the mammoth pikes fashioned out of scythes, as formidable to the eye as they were clumsy to the hand. There were weavers, brewers, carpenters, smiths, masons, bricklayers, cobblers, and representatives of every other of the trades of peace among these improvised men of war. Bridgewater, like Taunton, had yielded n so generously of its manhood to the service of the bastard duke that for any to abstain whose age and strength admitted of his bearing arms was to brand himself a coward or a papist. Yet Peter Blood, who was not only able to bear arms, uh, but trained and skilled in their use, who was certainly no coward and a papist only when it suited him, tended his geraniums and smoked his pipe on that warm July evening as indifferently as if nothing were afoot. One other thing he did. He flung after those war-fevered enthusiasts a line of Horace, a poet for whose work he had early conceived an inordinate affection. Quo, quo, celesti ruitus? Whither, whither, are you rushing to ruin? And now perhaps you guess why the hot, intrepid blood inherited from the roving sires of his Somersetshire mother remained cool amidst all this frenzied, fanatical heat of rebellion. Why the turbulent spirit which had forced him uh, once from the sedate academical bonds his father would have imposed on him, should now remain quiet in the very midst of turbulence. You realize now he regarded these men who were rallying to the banners of liberty, the banners woven by the virgins of Taunton, the girls from the seminaries of Miss Blake and Miss Musgrove, who, as the ballad runs, had ripped open their silk petticoats to make colors for King Monmouth's army. That Latin line, contemptuously flung after them as they clattered down the cobbled street, reveals his mind. To him, they were fools rushing in wicked frenzy upon their ruin. You see, he knew too much about his fellow Monmouth and the pretty brown slut who had borne him, to be deceived by the legend of legitimacy on the strength of which this standard of rebellion had been raised. He had read the absurd proclamation posted at the cross at Bridgewater, as it had been posted also at Taunton and elsewhere, setting forth that upon the decrease of our upon the decease of our sovereign Lord Charles the Second, the right of succession to the crown of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, with the dominions and territories thereunto belonging, did legally descend and devolve upon the most illustrious and high-born Prince James, Duke of Monmouth, son and heir apparent to the said King Charles the Second. It had moved him to laughter. As has had the further announcement that James, Duke of York, did first cause the said late king to be poisoned, and immediately thereupon did usurp and invade the crown. He knew not which was the greater lie, for Mr. Blood had spent a third of his life in the Netherlands, where this same James Scott, who now proclaimed himself James the Second by the grace of God, King, etc., first saw the light of some six-and-thirty years ago, and he was acquainted with the story current there of the fellow's real paternity. Far from being legitimate, by virtue of a pretended secret marriage between Charles Stuart and Lucy Walter, it was possible that this Monmouth, who now proclaimed himself King of England, 
was not even the illegitimate child of the late sovereign. What but ruin and disaster could be the end of this grotesque pretense, pretension? How could, he, could it be hoped that England would ever swallow such a perkin? And it was on his behalf to uphold his fantastic claim that these West Country clods, led by a few uh, armigorous Whigs, had been seduced into rebellion. Quo, quo, celesti ruitus. He laughed and sighed in one. But the laugh dominated the sigh, for Mr. Blood was unsympathetic, as are most self-sufficient men. And he was very self-sufficient. Adversity had taught him to be. A more tender-hearted man, possessing his vision and his knowledge, might have found cause for tears in the contemplation of these ardent, simple, nonconformist sheep going forward to the shambles, escorted to the rallying ground on Castle Field by wives and daughters, sweethearts and mothers, sustained by the delusion that they were to take the field in defense of right, of liberty, and of religion. For he knew, as all Bridgewater knew, and had known now for some hours, that it was Monmouth's intention to deliver battle that same night. The Duke was to lead a surprise attack upon the Royalist army under Feversham that was now encamped on Sedgemoor. Mr. Blood assumed that Lord Feversham would be equally well informed, and if in his, this assumption he was wrong, at least he was justified of it. He was not to suppose the royalist commander so indifferently skilled in the trade he followed. Mr. Blood knocked the ashes from his pipe and drew back to close his window. As he did so, his glance traveling straight across the street met at last the glance of those hostile eyes that watched him. There were two pairs, and they belonged to the Mrs. Pitt, two amiable, sentimental maiden ladies who yielded to none in Bridgewater in their worship of the handsome Monmouth. Mr. Blood smiled and inclined his head, for he was on friendly terms with these ladies, one of whom, indeed, had been for a little while his patient. But there was no response to his greeting. Instead, the eyes gave him back a stare of cold disdain. The smile on his thin lips grew a little broader, a little less pleasant. He understood the reason of that hostility, which had been daily growing in the past week since Monmouth had come to turn the brains of women of all ages. The Mrs. Pitt, he apprehended, uh, condemned him that he, a young and vigorous man of a military training which might now be valuable to the cause, should stand aloof, that he should placidly smoke his pipe and tend to his geraniums on this evening of all evenings when men of spirit were rallying to the Protestant champion offering their blood to place him on the throne where he belonged. If Mr. Blood had condescended to debate the matter with these ladies, he might have urged that, having had his fill of wandering and adventuring, he was now embarked upon the career for which he had been originally intended and for which his studies had equipped him, that he was a man of medicine and not of war, a healer, not a slayer. But they would have answered him, he knew, that in such a cause it has behooved every man who deemed himself a man to take up arms. They would have pointed out that their own nephew Jeremiah, who was by trade a sailor, the master of a ship, which by an ill chance for that young man had come to anchor at this season in Bridgewater Bay, had quitted the helm to snatch up a musket in defense of right. But Mr. Blood was not of those who argue. As I have said, he was a self-sufficient man. He closed the window, 
drew the curtains, and turned to the pleasant candle-lighted room, and the table on which Mrs. Barlow, his housekeeper, was in the very act of spreading supper. To her, however, he spoke aloud his thought. It's out of favor I am with the vinegary virgins over the way. He had a pleasant, vibrant voice, whose metallic ring was softened and muted by the Irish accent, which, in all his wanderings, he had never lost. It was a voice that could woo seductively and caressingly, or command in such a way as to compel obedience. Indeed, the man's whole nature was in that voice of his. For the rest of him, he was tall and spare, swarthy of tint as a gypsy, with eyes that were startlingly blue in the dark face, and under those level black brows. In their glance, those eyes, flanking a high-bridged intrepid nose, were of singular penetration, and of a steady haughtiness that went well with his firm lips. Though dressed in black, as became his calling, yet it was with an elegance derived from the love of clothes that is peculiar um, to the adventurer he had been, rather than to the staid medicus he now was. His coat was a fine camlet, and it was laced with silver. There were ruffles of a uh, mechlin at his wrists, and a mechlin cravat en encased his throat. His great black periwig was as, as sedulously curled as any in Whitehall. Seeing him thus, and perceiving his real nature, which was plain upon him, you might have been tempted to speculate how long such a man would be content to lie by in this little backwater of the world, into which chance had swept him some six months ago. How long! Uh, he would continue to pursue the trade for which he had uh, for, which, for which he had qualified himself before he began to live. Difficult of belief, though it may be when you know his history, previous and subsequent, yet it is possible that, but for the trick that fate was about to play him, he might have continued this peaceful existence, settling down completely to the life of a doctor in this Somersetshire Haven. It is possible, but not probable. He was the son of an Irish medicus of a Somersetshire lady in whose veins ran the rover blood of the Frobishers, which may account for a certain wildness that had early manifested itself in his disposition. This wildness had profoundly alarmed his father, who, for an Irishman, was of a singularly peace-loving nature. He had early resolved that the boy should follow in his own honorable profession, and Peter Blood, being quick to learn and oddly greedy of knowledge, had satisfied his parent by receiving at the age of twenty the degree of Baccalaureus Medicinae at Trinity College, Dublin. His father survived that satisfaction by three months only. His mother had been dead some years already. Thus, Peter Blood came into an inheritance of some few hundred pounds with which he had set out to see the world and give for a season a free rein to that restless spirit by which he was imbued. A set of curious chances led him to take service with the Dutch, then at war with France, and a predilection for the sea made him elect that the service should be upon that element. He had the advantage of a commission under the famous de Reuter, and fought in the Mediterranean engagement in which that great Dutch admiral lost his life. After the peace of Nimingwen, his uh, movements are obscure, but we know that he spent two years in a Spanish prison, though we do not know how he contrived to get there. It may be due to this that upon his release he took his sword to France, and saw service with the French 
uh, in their warring upon the Spanish Netherlands. Having reached, at last, the age of 32, his appetite for adventure surfeited, and uh, his health having grown indifferent as the result of a neglected wound. He was suddenly overwhelmed by homesickness. He took ship from Nantes with intent to cross to Ireland, but the vessel being driven by stress of weather into Bridgewater Bay and Blood's health having grown worse during the voyage, he decided to go ashore there, additionally urged to it by the fact that it was his mother's native soil. Thus, in January of that year, 1685, he had come to Bridgewater, possessor of a fortune that was approximately the same as that with which he had originally set out from Dublin eleven years ago. Because he liked the place, in which his health was rapidly restored to him, and because he conceived that he had passed through adventures enough for a, a man's lifetime, he determined to settle there and take up at last the profession of medicine from which he had, uh, with so little profit, broken away. That is all his story, or so, so much of it as matters up to that night, six months later, when the Battle of Sedgemoor was fought. Deeming the impending action no affair of his, as indeed it was not, the, and indifferent to the activity with which Bridgewater was that night agog, Mr. Blood closed his ears to the sounds of it and went early to bed. He was peacefully asleep long before eleven o'clock, at which hour, as you know, Monmouth rode but with his rebel host along the Bristol Road, circuitously to avoid the marshland that lay directly between himself and the royal army. You also know that his numerical advantage, possibly counterbalanced by the greater steadiness of the regular troops on the other side, and the advantages he derived from falling by surprise upon an army that was more or less asleep, were all lost to him by blundering and bad leadership before ever he was at grips with Feversham. The armies came into collision in the neighborhood of two o'clock in the morning. Mr. Blood slept undisturbed through the distant boom of cannon. Not until four o'clock, when the sun was rising to dispel the last wisps of mist over that stricken field of battle, did he awaken from his tranquil slumbers. He sat up in bed, rubbed his sleep from his eyes, and collected himself. Blows were thundering upon the door of his house, and a voice was calling incoherently. This was the noise that had aroused him, conceiving that he had to do with some urgent obstetrical case, he reached for a bedgown and slippers to go below. On the landing he almost collided with Mrs. Barlow, new risen and unsightly in the state of panic. He quieted her cluckings with a word of reassurance, and went himself to open. There in the slanting golden light of the new risen sun stood a breathless, wild-eyed man and a steaming horse. Smothered in dust and grime, his clothes in disarray, the left sleeve of his doublet hanging in rags, this young man opened his lips to speak, yet for a long moment remained speechless. In that moment, Mr. Blood recognized him for the young shipmaster, Jeremiah Pitt, the nephew of the maiden ladies opposite one who had been drawn by the general enthusiasm into the vortex of that rebellion. The street was rousing, awakened by the sailors' noisy advent. Doors were opening and lattices were being unlatched for the protrusion of anxious, inquisitive heads. "'Take your time now,' said Mr. Blood. "'I never knew speed made by overhaste.' But the wild-eyed lad paid no heed to the admonition. He plunged headlong into the speech, gasping, breathless. 
It's Lord Gilroy, he panted. He is sore wounded at Oglethorpe's farm by the river. I bore him thither, and and, and he, he sent me for you. Come away, come away. He would have clutched the doctor and haled him forth by force in bedgown and slippers as he was. But the doctor eluded that too eager hand. I'll be sure, uh, to be sure, I'll come, said he. He was distressed. Gildoy had been a very uh, friendly, generous patron to him since his settling in these parts, and Mr. Blood was eager enough to do uh, what he now could to discharge the debt. Grieved that the occasion should have arisen, and in such a manner, for he knew quite well that the rash young nobleman had been an active agent of the Duke's. To be sure, I'll come, but first give me leave to get some clothes and other things that I may need. There's no time to lose. Be easy now. I'll lose none. I'll tell you again. You'll go to the quickest. You'll go quickest by going leisurely. Come in. Take a chair. He threw open the door of a parlor. Young Pitt waved aside the invitation. I'll wait here. Make haste in God's name. Mr. Blood went off to dress and to fetch a case of instruments. Questions concerning the, pre the precise nature of Lord Gildoy's hurt could wait until they were on their way. Whilst he pulled on his boots, he gave Mrs. Barlow instructions for the day, which included the matter of a dinner he was not destined to eat. When at last he went forth again, Mrs. Barlow clucking after him like a disgruntled fowl, he found young Pitt smothered in a crowd of scared, half-dressed townspeople townsfolk, mostly women who had come hastening for news of how the battle had sped. The news he gave them was to be read in the lamentations with which they disturbed the morning air. At sight of the doctor, dressed and booted, the case of instruments tucked under his arm, the messenger disengaged himself from those who pressed about, shook off his weariness, and the two tearful ants that clung most closely, and seizing the bridle of his horse, he climbed to the saddle. "'Come along, sir!' he cried. "'Mount behind me!' Mr. Blood, without wasting words, did as he was bidden. Pitt touched the horse with his spur. The little crowd gave way, and thus upon the crupper of that doubly laden horse, clinging to the belt of his companion, Peter Blood set out upon his odyssey. For this Pitt in whom he beheld no more than the messenger of a wounded rebel gentleman, was indeed the very messenger of fate. Chapter 2, entitled Kirk's Dragoons Oglethorpe's farm stood a mile or so to the south of Bridgewater, on the right bank of the river. It was a straggling Tudor building, showing uh, gray above the ivy that clothed its lower parts. Approaching it now through the fragment, uh, for, through the fragrant orchards amid which it seemed to drowse in Ac uh, Arcadian peace beside the waters of the Parrot. Sparkling in the morning sunlight, Mr. Blood might have had a difficulty in believing it part of a world tormented by strife and bloodshed. On the bridge, as they had been riding out of Bridgewater, they had met a vanguard of fugitives from the field of battle. Weary, broken men, many of them wounded, all of them terror-stricken, staggering in speedless haste, with the last remnants of their strength into the shelter which it was in their vain illusion the town would afford them. Eyes glazed with lassitude and fear looked up piteously out of haggard faces at Mr. Blood and his companion as they rode forth. Hoarse cries, hoarse voices cried a warning that merciless pursuit was not far behind. Undeterred, however, Young Pitt 
road amain along the dusty road by which these poor fugitives from that swift route on Sedgemoor came flocking in ever-increasing numbers. Presently he swung aside, and quitting the road, took to a pathway that crossed the dewy meadowlands. Even here they met odd groups of these human derelicts, who were scattering in all directions, looking fearfully behind them as they came through the long grass, expecting at every moment to see the red coats of the dragoons. But as Pitt's direction was a southward one, bringing them ever nearer to Feversham's headquarters, they were presently clear of that human flotsam and jetsam of the battle, and riding through the peaceful orchards heavy with the ripening fruit that was soon to make its annual yield of cider. At last they alighted on the kidney stones of the courtyard, and Baines, the master of the homestead, grave of countenance and flustered of manner, gave them welcome. In the spacious stone-flagged hall, the doctor found Lord Gildoy, a very tall and dark young gentleman prominent of chin and nose, stretched on the, the cane daybed under one of the tall mullioned windows in the care of Mrs. Baines and her comely daughter. His cheeks were leaden-hued, his eyes closed, and from his blue lips came with each labored breath a faint moaning noise. Mr. Blood stood for a moment silently considering his patient. He deplored that a youth of, with such bright hopes in life as Lord Gildoy's should have risked all, perhaps existence itself, to forward the ambition of a worthless adventurer. Because he had liked and honored this brave lad, he paid his case uh, the tribute of a sigh. Then he knelt to his task, ripped away doublet and underwear, to, and to lay bare his lordship's mangled side, and called for water and linen, and what else he needed for his work. He was still intent upon it half hour later, when the dragoons invaded the homestead. The clatter of hooves and hoarse shouts that heralded their approach disturbed him not at all. For one thing, he was not easily disturbed. For another, his task absorbed him. But his lordship, who had now recovered consciousness, showed considerable alarm, and the battle-stained Jeremy Pitt sped to cover in a clothes press, uh, sped to cover in a clothes press. Hmm. Baines was uneasy, and his wife and daughter trembled. Mr. Blood reassured them. Why, what's to fear? He said. It's a Christian country, this, and Christian men do not make war upon the wounded, nor upon those who harbor them. He still had, you see, illusions about Christians. He had held he held a glass of cordial prepared under his directions to his lordship's list, lips. Give your mind peace, my lord, the worst is done. And then they came rattling and clanking into the stone-flagged hall, a round dozen jack-booted, lobster-coated troopers of the Tangiers Regiment, led by a sturdy, black-browed fellow with a deal of gold lace about the breast of his coat. Baines stood his ground, his attitude half-defiant, whilst his wife and daughter shrank, shrank away in renewed fear. Mr. Blood, at the head of the daybed, looked over his shoulder to take stock of the invaders. The officer barked an order, which brought his men to an attentive halt, then swaggered forward, his gloved hand bearing down on the pommel of his sword, his spurs jingling musically as he moved. He announced his authority to the yeoman. I am Captain Hobart of Colonel Kirk's Dragoons. What rebels do you harbor? The yeoman took alarm at the ferocious truculence. It expressed itself in his trembling voice. I, I am no harbor of rebels, sir. This wounded gentleman, I can see for myself, 
captain stamped forward to the daybed and scowled down upon the grey-faced sufferer. No need to ask how he came to this state and by his wounds. A damned rebel! That's enough for me. He flung a command at his dragoons. Out with him, my lads! Mr. Blood got between the daybed and the troopers. In the name of humanity, sir, said he, on a note of anger. This is England, not Tangiers. The gentleman is in sore case. He may not be moved without peril to his life. Captain Hobart was amused. Oh, I am to be tender of the lives of these rebels. Odds blood. Do you think it's to benefit his health we're taking him? There's gallows being planted along the road from Weston to Bridgewater, and he'll serve for one of them as well as another. Colonel Kirk will learn these non-conforming oafs, something they'll not forget in generations. You're hanging men without trial? Faith, then it's mistaken I am. We hit, we're in Tangiers, after all, it seems, where your regiment belongs. The captain considered him with a, kin, a kindly eye. He looked over him from the soles of his riding boots to the crown of his periwig. He noted the spare, active frame, the arrogant poise of his head, the air of authority that invested Mr. Blood, and the soldier recognized soldier. The captain's eyes narrowed. Recognition went further. Who the hell may you be? he exploded. My name is Blood, sir. Peter Blood at your service. Aye, aye, Codso, that's the name you were in French service once, were you not? If Mr. Blood was surprised, he did not betray it. I was. Then I remember you. Five years ago, or more, you were in Tangiers. If that is so, I knew your colonel. Faith, you may be renewing the acquaintance. The captain laughed unpleasantly. What brings you here, sir? This wounded gentleman. I was fetched to attend him. I'm a medicus. Doctor? You? Scorn of that lie, as he conceived it, rang in the heavy, hectoring voice. Medicine baccalaureus, said Mr. Blood. "'Don't fling your French at me, man!' snapped Hobart. "'Speak English!' Mr. Blood's smile annoyed him. "'I am a physician practicing my calling in the town of Bridgewater.' The captain sneered. "'Which you reached by way of Lyme Regis in the following of your bastard duke!' It was Mr. Blood's turn to sneer. If your wit were as big as your voice, my dear, it's the great man you'd be by this. For a moment the dragoon was speechless. The color deepened in his face. You may find me great enough to hang you. Faith, yes, you've the look of a, of the, and the manners of a hangman. But if you practice your trade on my patient here, you may be putting a rope around your own neck. He's not the kind you may string up with no questions asked. He has a right to trial, and the right to trial by his peers. By his peers? The captain was taken aback by these three words, which Mr. Blood had stressed. Sure, now, but any, any but a fool or a savage would have asked his name before ordering him to the gallows. The gentleman is my Lord Gildoy. And then his lordship spoke for himself in a weak voice. I make no concealment of my association with the Duke of Monmouth. I'll take the consequences, but, if you please, I'll take them after trial, by my peers, as the doctor has said. The feeble voice ceased and was followed by a moment's silence. As is common in many blustering men, 
There was a deal of timidity deep down in Hobart. The announcement of his lordship's rank had touched those depths. A servile upstart, he stood in awe of titles, and he stood in awe of his colonel. Percy Kirk was not lenient with blunderers. By a gesture, he checked his men. He must consider. Mr. Blood, observing his pause, added further matter for his consideration. You'll be remembering, Captain, that Lord Gildoy will have friends and relatives on the Tory side, who will have something to say to Colonel Kirk if his lordship should be handled like a common felon. You go, you'll go warily, Captain, or, as I've said, it's a halter for your neck he'll be, you'll be weaving this morning. Captain Hobart swept the warming, swept, let's try this again. Captain Hobart swept the warning aside with a bluster of contempt, but he acted upon it nonetheless. Take up the day bed, he said he, and convey him on that to Bridgewater. Uh, lodge him in the jail until I uh, take order about him. He may not survive the journey, Blood remonstrated. He's in no case to be moved. So much the worse for him. My affair is to round up rebels. He confirmed his order by a gesture. Two of his men took up the daybed and swung to depart with it. Gildoy made a feeble effort to put forth a hand towards Mr. Blood. Sir, he said, you leave me in your debt. If I live, I shall study how to discharge it. Mr. Blood bowed for an answer, and then to the men, Bear him steadily, he commanded. His life depends on it. As his lordship was carried out, the captain became brisk. He turned upon the yeoman. What other cursed rebels do you harbor? None other. His lordship. We've dealt with his lordship for the present. We'll deal with you in a moment when we've searched your house. And by God, if you've lied to me. He broke off, snarling to give an order. Four of his dragoons went out. In a moment, they were heard moving noisily in the adjacent room. Meanwhile, the captain was questing about the hall, sounding the wainscoting with the butt of a pistol. Mr. Blood saw no profit to himself in lingering. By your leave, it's a very good day I'll be wishing you, said he. By my leave, you'll remain a while, the captain ordered him. Mr. Blood shrugged and sat down. You're tiresome, he said. I wonder your colonel hasn't discovered it yet. But the captain did not heed him. He was stooping to pick up a soiled and dusty hat in which there was pinned a little bunch of oak leaves. It had been lying near the clothes press in which the unfortunate Pitt had taken refuge. The captain smiled malevolently. His eyes raked the room, resting first sardonically on the yeoman, then on the two women in the background, and finally on Mr. Blood, who sat with one leg thrown over the other in an attitude of indifference that was far from reflecting his mind. Then the captain stepped to the press and pulled open one of the wings of its massive oaken door. He took the huddled inmate by the collar of his doublet and lugged him out into the open. "'And who the devil's this?' quoth he. "'Another nobleman?' Mr. Blood had a vision of those gallows of which Captain Hobart had spoken, and of this unfortunate young shipmaster going to adorn one of them, strung up without trial in the place of the other victim of whom the captain had been cheated. On the spot he invented not only a title but a whole family for the young rebel. Faith, you've said it, Captain. This is Viscount Pitt, first cousin of Sir Thomas Vernon, who's married to that slut Moll Kirk, sister to your own colonel, and sometime lady-in-waiting upon King James's queen. Both the captain and his prisoner gasped, but 
Whereas thereafter young Pitt discreetly held his peace, the captain rapped out a nasty oath. He considered his prisoner again. He is lying, is he not? he demanded, seizing the lad by the shoulder and glaring into his face. He's rallying Rue, by God. If you believe that, said Blood, hang him and see what happens to you. The dragoon glared at the doctor and then at his prisoner. Cha! He thrust the lad into the hands of his men. Fetch him along to Bridgewater and make fast that fellow also, he pointed to Baines. We'll show him what it means to harbor and comfort rebels. There was a moment of confusion. Baines struggled in the grip of the troopers, protesting vehemently. The terrified women screamed until silenced by a greater terror. The captain strode across to them. He took the girl by the shoulders. She was a pretty, golden-headed creature with soft blue eyes and looked up entreatingly, piteously into the face of the dragoon. He leered upon her, his eyes aglow, took her chin in his hand and set her shuddering by a, his brutal kiss. It's an earnest, he said, smiling grimly. Let that quiet you, little rebel, till I've done with these rogues. And he swung away again, leaving her faint and trembling in the arms of her anguished mother. His men stood grinning, awaiting orders, the two prisoners now fast pinioned. Take them away! Let Coronet Drake have charge of them. His smoldering eye again sought the cowering girl. I'll stay a while to search out this place. There may be other rebels hidden here. As an afterthought, he added, And take this fellow with you, he pointed to Mr. Blood. Bestir! Mr. Blood started out of his musings. He had been considering that in this case, that in his case of instruments, there was a lancet with which he might perform on Captain Hobart a beneficial operation. Beneficial, that is, to humanity. In any case, the dragoon was obviously uh, plethoric and would be the better for a bloodletting. The difficulty lay in making the opportunity. He was beginning to wonder if he could lure the captain aside with some tale of hidden treasure when this untimely interruption set a term to that interesting speculation. He sought to temporize. Faith, it will cert suit me very well, said he, for Bridgewater is my destination, and but that ye detained me, I'd have been on my way thither now. Your destination will be the jail. Ah, bah! You're surely joking. There's a gallows for you, if you prefer it. It's merely a question of now or later. Rude hands seized Mr. Blood, and that uh, precious lancet was in the case on the table out of reach. He twisted out of the grip of the dragoons, for he was strong and agile. But they closed with him again immediately and bore him down, pinning him to the ground. They tied his wrists behind his back, then roughly pulled him to his feet again. Take him away, said Hobart shortly, and turned to issue his orders to the other waiting troopers. Go search the house from attic to cellar and then report to me here. The soldiers trailed out by the door leading to the interior. Mr. Blood was thrust by his guards into the courtyard where Pitt and Baines already waited. From the threshold of the hall he looked back at Captain Hobart, and his sapphire eyes were blazing. On his lips trembled a threat of what he would do to Hobart if he should happen to survive this business. Betimes he remembered that to utter it were probably to extinguish his chance of living to execute it. For today the king's men were masters in the West, and the West was regarded as an as enemy country. 
to be subjected to the worst horror of war by the victorious side. Here a captain of horse was for the moment lord of life and death. Under the apple trees in the orchard, Mr. Blood and his companions in misfortune were made fast each to a trooper's stirrup leather. Then, at the sharp order of the cornet, the little troop started for Bridgewater. As they set out, there was the fullest confirmation of Mr. Blood's hideous assumption that to the dragoons this was a conquered enemy country. There were sounds of rending timbers, of furniture smashed and overthrown, the shouts and laughter of brutal men to announce that this hunt for rebels was no more than a pretext for pillage and destruction. Finally, above all other sounds, came the piercing screams of a woman in acutest agony. Baines checked in his stride and swung round, writhing his face ashen. As a consequence, he was jerked from his feet by the rope that attached him to the stirrup leather and was, and he was dragged helplessly a yard or two before the trooper reined in, cursing him foully and striking him with the flat of his sword. It came to Mr. Blood as he trudged forward under the laden apple trees on that fragrant, delicious July morning, that man, as he had long suspected, was the vilest work of God, and that only a fool would set himself up as a healer of a species that was best exterminated. And there we go. That, my friends, is chapters one and two of Captain Blood. We're off to a rousing start. Thank you so much for joining me. Please be with me again on Monday at 4 p.m., and we will read chapters 3 and 4. Have a good weekend, everybody. We'll see you again. Bye.